everybody. Well, another fine mess I've gotten myself into. Another fine mess I've gotten myself into. Why would you say that? Because if you're very astute and you're waiting for one of them to start, guess what? <clears throat> that didn't happen. That did not happen. So right now, the one that says upcoming, never going to happen. Just not going to do it. Why? Because it's, it's Monday. It's something. It's the day. You know, it's one of them days. It's been one of them weeks. It's been one of those months. Yeah, man. Yeah, man. It has been one of those. So let's see if we can get rid of this one forever. Delete that forever. Live now. I bet that does delete forever. Sorry you have to live through my uh, faux pas corrections right here. So I'll, I hope I've got sound. I hope I've got my mic turned on. And it says it's live. It's not Memorex, dudes. It's me. It's me. It's Ernest T. Yes, sir. Let's see. Let's see if we can do this. Will it still do that? Maybe. It might do that. It may. It may just screw the whole thing up. If it screws the whole thing up, dudes, I am just going to go turn this off and go to bed. That's all there is to it. Yeah, man. So, if you read the post on YouTube or Facebook, you know, or maybe you suspect, that currently I have the flu. It's been a rough time, rough couple of months. When was it? When was it, dude? Let's look back right here. <sighs> well, I can't find... Oh, there it is. November the 6th, I did the show, and I had Corona. Right? So, this is a little over a month later, and... The wife brought home the dang flu. And she brought home the corona. I told her she's not allowed to go out anymore. She can't go do fun things. She can't get in a crowd. Yeah, I'm back on my old camera. I missed that little... Uh, it's a... This was the one I was trying to use. It was just a USB, you know webcam kind of deal if you're trying to earn your uh, only fans money with this thing you have to do a lot of extra work maybe you could tailor your only fans to the heart of seeing heart of seeing huh that's the way my brain's working now Hard of seeing. Yep. So, were you watching the right show? I, I, Clell, I, I boogered it up and it ended up being two shows for the same thing. And one went live and I deleted the other one. So, you're here. So, you probably at some point figured that out. Or you came in late enough to know or not even see that faux pas, so just forget what I just said. Everything's perfect. I didn't make any mistakes. Yeah, right. All right, so last weekend we talked about <clears throat> the start of, of aerial combat. And I said last or Monday that uh, I was thinking I'd do one on the buzz bomb. Then I thought, well, why limit myself? I mean, you know, I'm such a broad-minded person. I would just 
and look at some of these super weapons that uh, the Germans were thinking of. And anybody knows German scientists are no joke. I just, I, it's just amazing to me how one man, and it, well, I guess it just wasn't one man, you know, Hitler surrounded himself and was able to pull in, you know, motivational people. And that spread. And then, you know, but let's just say the catalyst, he was the catalyst, could change, you know, the direction of a country forever. But the scientists were, like I said, no joke. And I don't know where you start thinking about these things. I don't know. I don't know where countries, including the U.S. and Germany, especially back then, came up with the money, the funds to do this, to do these things, even on a small scale. And sometimes it wasn't a small scale. It was a large scale. I mean, you know, you've got the scientists that have to figure this out, the testing that has to go on. <coughs> Excuse me. All those kind of things. And then you have to make prototypes. You have to have the people to manufacture these. And if you're going to build them on scale, then you've got to have a factory. And then you've got to ramp these things up. You know, yeah, they were making airplanes already. So just for the instance of the buzz bomb, you know, it looks like, we'll look at pictures of them here. But it looks like, you know, they took a torpedo, put wings on it, and strapped an engine on the back. Maybe it was just that simple. Maybe they just brought parts from every place, and they had a dude that just welded them all up, threw the insides in it, put the engine on it, and fired them puppies up. Maybe not. I don't know. But, so let's get over here. I've got a Warfare History Network website brought up. And we're going to look at some of these things. Uh, let me shrink my face down. Get me over here in the corner. Da -da -da, da -da 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 -da. And there it is. I'm assuming that is a real picture. And sometimes, you know, you look at that and go, oh, wow, that's pretty cool. Then you start looking at the scale. So if you look at the scale, this is the cockpit here. See my little cursor thing floating around? Of course, that's cockpit, and I'm going to say it's at least two man, because that's a huge plane. And it's just a flying wing. See, that's what kind of amazes me, is, you know, they had the flying wing. And, it, and we, we had airplanes with wings and, and propeller engines on the front. I don't know. I don't know. All right. This is by Mason B. Webb. I, get a, I hear a ringing in my ear. Is it coming through on your guys' end? Or is it just my dad gone hearing messed up? You know, ringing in my ear. Now, this was pretty cool. Let's see, what they call this thing? Get over here. You hold it Goliath. I can't pronounce the German word. But see this little thing right here? <clears throat> I mean, I don't know what, it's a daggone mini uh, tank. And I don't know if I ever knew that they were using these things. I don't know, and it doesn't come to mind when I was reading about it. I was thinking, man, I don't think I ever heard of that before. But he describes it as 
All right, so you're in a foxhole in the front lines looking and listening for any signs of the signs of the Germans. You see a small, funny track vehicle heading your way. It looks like a toy. A miniature tank without a turret or a gun. Nothing out there. What is it? You call out to your buddies in the foxhole next to you and direct his attention to the long, little interloper. You might even smile and laugh a little at the contraption, but the next minute your laughter is cut short when it explodes and kills you. So this little Dickens carried 220 pounds of explosives. It was remote controlled. And when I think of remote control, I think radio controlled. But don't fall into my trap. That was not it at all. It was remote controlled. It had a 2,130 foot long tether, triple stranded cable attached to the rear of the vehicle, which was used for transmitting power to the electric drive version. Later, mo later models were powered by gasoline. Could you imagine? I don't know how much it weighed, but listen, it's carrying 200. And <coughs> <coughs> it's carrying 220 pounds of explosives. So if you're going to carry that weight, let's just say the whole track mechanisms, the engines, and all that stuff weigh another 220 pounds. So let's just say it's 500 pounds moving across the ground. Can you imagine the electricity you would have to pump out to that thing? And it was, you can't just add sections on. So even if you were going to go a thousand feet, you still had 2,100 feet of cable there. I'm sure it was on some kind of spool. Had to be. So they plugged the spool feed into whatever they were using for power. Had to be generators, right? Had to be a generator of some kind. Big old bad. Big old boy. And they do would control it and off it would go, pulling the little cable behind it. So you're still feeding electrical power through 2,100 feet of cable. Lots of resistance. Lots of resistance. And they're going to have to be pretty stout. Then you get out there. It's 220 pounds of explosives. That's a lot. But surely you wouldn't, you wouldn't put one of these things up against a two-man foxhole. I mean, I don't know how big of an area that that would cover. You know, if they were really thinking, they put like a, you know, 200 pounds of explosives and 25 pounds or 20 pounds of ball bearings or something in there. Let's make some shrapnel. So, but anyway, it, I just, <laughs> you start thinking about it, that, that blows my mind. So later on, they got smart, kind of smart. They used gasoline engine, but then that would make a lot more noise. So let's say you were doing it at night. Electric is the way to go. You know, if you're trying to sneak up on, let's say, a machine gun nest, that would be worth your, your time and effort. Or, you know, an uh, airplane or a tank or, you know, or something. All right. I don't see where it, uh, two strands were used to control the glyph, and the third was used to detonate it. Doesn't say how many of those they built, but, I mean, I'm sure it was armored, so you couldn't shoot it with your rifle. They, you know, they had to have planned this thing. And I'm sure they had some dude on a pair of binoculars or telescope, you know, you know, oh, you're, you're getting ready to come up on a hole, you know, go right two meters or there's a stump in your way or something you know go left go right so there had been a guy spotting it <coughs> so you know if he saw some people coming out to try to disable it they might just you know blow it up so <coughs> They had the world's first true jet single engine airplane. Right? 1939, one week before Germany invaded Poland, the German Air Ministry was not impressed by a prototype's performance, however, and the program was ended. This was followed by the HE 280, 
which first flew in March of 1941, so two years later, but also never gained the Luftwaffe's acceptance. Only nine HE-280s were built before the contract was canceled. I wonder where these, these are now. You think they kept them? Or when the, they were scrapped, they just said, oh, you know, let's take the parts off of this and use it on something else. Let's re, you know, repurpose the fuselage or something. I don't know. So this picture here is the ME-262. was the world's first operational jet fighter. Here, ground crewmen prepare a camouflage net shrouding the ME-262 for takeoff at an unnamed German airbase. Okay, Messerschmitt ME-262A, the Swallow, that was most people today regard as the world's first successful jet fighter. Small by the standards of today's fighters, it was less than 35 feet long with a wingspan of 41 feet. The Schwab had a range of 650 miles, a ceiling of 37,500 feet, a maximum speed of 541 miles an hour. The P-51 Mustang was powered by a Rolls-Royce Merlin engine, had a range of 950 miles, a ceiling of 41,900 feet, and a top speed of 437 miles an hour. So the P-51 Mustang was a better plane. It could go higher, it could go longer, and it was faster. Well, no, let's see. No, it wasn't. It was 437 miles per hour, and the jet was 541 miles an hour. So it wasn't faster. So production problems plagued the ME-262 program. Uh, the scarcity of high temperature resistant alloys required by the engine was a major problem, as were the continual changes in design. They never could decide. Yeah. And that was, I mean, it pretty much, I guess, I won't say dominated the skies of P 51, but, I mean, you know, let's see how many it said. 8,000 of the P 51D models were produced in the U.S. You know, that doesn't sound like a lot. But you start thinking about it, that's a lot. And that wasn't the only plane being produced. You know, at the time, I'm sure there were, you know, you know, I don't know, hundreds, I won't say hundreds, but different bombers and other fighters and the Corsairs and, you know, the ones that the wings folded up and they could store them on, you know, aircraft carriers with the wings folded up, all that kind of stuff. But the ME-262, they never could decide whether they wanted to make it fighter or a fighter bomber or a bomber. So anyway. It got scrapped too along the way. So then they went to a uh, another jet. Other German aircraft never got far beyond the drawing board. The Messerschmitt MH329 Zurstor heavy fighter. Uh, flying wing fighter interceptor. The stubby wing swept wing tailless. P two ten fighter bomber. I can't pronounce those those ones. Two U.S. Air Force airmen posed in front of the H O two twenty nine that was captured by the Americans at the end of the war. I mean, look at that thing, man. That is so cool. One exotic aircraft was produced, and made it to prototype stage. It was the 229 Flying Wing Fighter Bomber. In response to Luftwaffe's Chief Hermann Goring's call for a light <coughs> jet powered bomber capable of carrying a payload of 2,200 tons, only 20 of this radical plane were ever made. Hmm. That is. I guess that's a picture of the one that I saw on the front. Yeah, the front tire. I mean, I don't know why, man, that, but it seems to be 
largely out of proportion to the back ones. Maybe that's because the you know the engines were up front and it, it you know had a lot had to carry a lot of weight. It is really kind of weird looking. I like that first picture of it though when it was flying. I wonder how these guys got to stand. Who were these two yahoos that got to stand in front of this thing and have their picture made? You know, who were those guys? Who do they think they were? Janitors. <laughs> <laughs> Mm-hmm. Yep. Probably janitors. The dude's hiding the skinny guy, the one on the right there, he's hiding the mop behind his back. That's why he's got his feet together. <laughs> so the tanks, I mean, the only one that I thought was kind of unusual, the only one mentioned here was this big boy here. The Panzer eight weight in at 188 tons, but never made it to the battlefield. Two prototypes were captured by the Soviets. That's a pretty good size dude. Tanks are always big anyway. So, the Elephant tank destroyer, 88 millimeter gun, was powerful but mechanically unreliable. I thought tanks were other tank destroyers. Would you have to make a special tank to be a tank destroyer? What made it so dang on special? Okay, so here's the missiles. B-1 and B-2 rockets, flying bombs. Was the nickname given the buzz bomb and the doodle bug by the Allies. Relying on liquid fuel, and I thought last time I said it was like, <clears throat> I thought, some kind of crazy fuel like hydrogen peroxide or some kind of crazy. But not, it, it wasn't. I looked it up. Low grade anti, let's see, 80 octane gasoline. So, they were, you know, running crappy gas that wouldn't run in our lawnmowers now uh, to power this thing. So it's 29 foot long. Carried 2,000 pounds of explosives. Were launched against southern England beginning June 12, 43, from sites in northern Europe. There were an average of 190 launches per day of more than 10,000 in total. So this is kind of what I was talking about. Think about that. How do you how do you do that? I mean, it does look like torpedoes. Slap some wings on it, put a jet engine on it, and fill it full of you know fuel and explosives. But it was it wasn't guided. I don't know how it knew how to fly. I don't know if it knew what its target was or it just went until it, you know, ran out of fuel. Did they go and say, well, we're here. Our target's there. From the time we light this thing off and it gains altitude, it's going to fly for an hour and tw two minutes. And then it's going to descend and hopefully we'll hit the factory. We'll hit something of importance. So, you know, the scientists, I mean, you think, oh, well, no big deal. Shoot, that's a huge deal, especially back then. Didn't have computers they could plug stuff into and say, you know, <clears throat> go until you reach an altitude of 1,200 feet, level out at 1,200 feet, travel, you know, at 357 miles per hour, and then, you know, cut your throttle by 90%. Go into a shallow dive and just hit something. They didn't have any of that. So they were launched sometimes from airplanes, but
but mostly from uh, ramps. So maximum speed 340 to 400 miles an hour. They were susceptible to any aircraft guns and airplanes. One way the air the guys would do it would be fly their airplane up next to it because it it can't you know take evasive maneuvers and you know tip it over, hit it you know take their wing get up under it and pit maneuver it and tilt it up. And there it would go. Yeah, go off course. Of course, then you know, you know, is it armed? How did it arm? Was it armed the minute they left the ground? I don't know. One hundred ninety launches, ten thousand in total. That's crazy. Great, and they didn't. They said they weren't very accurate. But I don't care. 2,000 pounds of explosive flying over your head. Far more formidable weapon against which there was no defense. Brainchild Wither von Braun. V2 production took place at a secret laboratory. 1,760 V2 towards various targets. Now this is just a rocket. Ballistic missile. They used slave labor for concentration camps were used to build the weapons. So, after the war, the United States and the Soviet Union scooped up as many German rocket scientists as they could find in order to begin and develop their own ballistic missile and space program. Hey, there's Robert. Despite less than honorable past, Von Braun was brought to the United States and headed up government programs to create missile systems. He was also the driving force behind the American space program that put the man on the moon in 1969. So, where's his name? Let's see. Da, da, da. Werner von Braun. So he thought up this thing. So let's see. Paste that. Well. He's a nice looking fella. So that's the dude. There he is. Got that magnifying thing right in the middle of his face. Well, I guess there's one of these V2 rockets. What is that? I'm, gu <laughs> I'm guessing that's that dude's arm, but it looks like a pig's leg or something. What is that mess? That's, that's some of the worst Photoshop stuff I've ever seen. Maybe his arm was in a brace? I don't know. Oh, God, look at this dude down here. Holy cow. Well, he got sucker punched by the ugly hit, didn't he? Wow. That's a sad, that's a sad, sad face right there. Yeah, there he is again.
Interesting dudes. I like looking at old pictures. All right. Maybe I'll do a story on him one day. I don't know. I think this is the same guy, but he was supposedly uh, a satanic kind of dude that, that believed in the occult and all kinds of stuff. But they overlooked a bunch, a bunch of stuff on him to get him uh, in the, you know, United States to build rockets. All right, so here's something that blows your mind. Long-range artillery. So, Paris guns with their 112-foot long barrels, while the Big Berthas had a range of only 6 miles, the 240-millimeter 240, 240 Paris guns built by Krupp and transported on railroad carriages could fire a shell then unheard of a distance of 75 miles. When World War II broke out, the German looked again to large caliber long-range artillery. <clears throat> so they took and they built these humongous artillery guns and put them on Railroad cars, railroad, whatever, tracks. And just the scale of this, again, blows my mind. How in the world do you build something like that? I mean, these guys are standing. See these two little dudes right here? They're standing pretty far distance away. And I don't know if you can see these guys. There's two people standing right there. Look at that thing. And here are the guys up on top. If you can see them. Guys here and here. And a couple of guys there. Super gun called the V3 cannon or London gun. Its purpose was to shell London <coughs> with 300 shells per hour. It operated on a multi charge principle whereby once a 310 pound shell was fired, a series of solid fuel secondary propellant charges placed in symmetrical pairs along its 300 foot barrel would give it an extra boost to achieve a range just over 100 miles. Construction began in September 43. Built inside a hill with miles of support tunnels, the London gun, fortunately for the British, never became operational. July 6, 1944, Lancaster bombers of the RAF 617 Squadron, Dam Busters, knocked it out using 1,200-pound Paul Boy deep penetrating bombs. Some sources say that the U.S. Navy <clears throat> also got in on the act. decided to hit the site with a drone version of the B-29 Liberator bomber loaded with 2,100 pounds of Torpex explosives. One of the two pilots aboard the B-24 was Joseph P. Kennedy Jr., the son of former U.S. Ambassador to Britain and the older brother of future President John F. Kennedy. The plan was for the American airmen to take off in the bomber and then bail out. It would then be remotely guided to its target by following plane. But a malfunction occurred shortly after takeoff, and the plane exploded over Blissenburg, England, killing both Kennedy and the other pilot, Wilford Willie, Wilford J. Willie. Other sources say that the target was either a V-12, V-2 launching site or a U-boat pin. Huh. So they say it never became functional. I don't see how.
So this is not the one they're talking about. Is that not a picture of the one they're talking about? The heavy Gustav. That's in 1942. The seven ton projectile could be fired a maximum distance of 30 miles in 1942. It was the first used in the siege. Okay, so let's see. So that was, this picture was of a gun that was in 40, 1942. All right, so in 44, it's when they, so that is not even the gun they were going to use. This is one they actually built and did use, but the one they were going to, they're built inside the hill that the RAF exploded with the dam buster bombs was even bigger than that. That's still dang on big though. Look at that thing. Thing's huge. Uh, they were trying to <clears throat> develop the atomic bomb. I wonder what these guys. I wonder how many of these guys survived that, taking apart the nuclear pile, 30 miles southwest of Stuttgart in 45. They're just down in there digging that stuff out, man. All right, so there was one, let's see. This is not one of them. One of the things that I looked at, they talked about some really not super far-fetched, but there's another picture of that gun. So, Germany had night vision. The FG-1250 were on some tanks and on specialized assault rifles. If you're one of the lucky few to have a vampire, you had to lug around a 33-pound battery pack to power the thing up. 33 pounds worth of battery. Wow. So. One of the things that was really kind of weird was a spaced, space based mirror that they were planning on. So, uh, <clears throat> they called it the Sun Gun, inspired by an idea by Hermann Ober. Dating back to 1929, German scientists during the war were planning a space based mirror made of metallic sodium. The 3.5 square mile mirror would be able to focus the sun on Earth's surface with enough energy to boil an ocean or burn a city. After the war, though, the scientists told the Allies that the weapon would be completed within the next 100 years. So I thought that was interesting, so I looked it up. And... <clears throat> Here's what I found. Nineteen twenty nine German physicist Hermann Ober developed plans for a space station from which one hundred meter wide concave mirror could be used to reflect sunlight onto a concentrated point on Earth. So to me, this is a little bit of a, the uh, horse before the cart. Is they're developing this mirror. They don't even have a dang old space station yet. Don't you think you ought to, well, you know, I've made this mirror and it's huge. <clears throat> but you can't even go into space. Don't you think you ought to be able to get into space first? And, and work in space? I don't understand why they were even thinking about it. I mean, yeah, you could write these plans down 
and give the guy, you know, hey, take two or three weeks, write your stuff down, draw up some plans, you know, get a rough idea, get a pretty good idea how this might work, and then set it aside and get your butt back to the real problem of winning this war. Why would you pay a scientist and, you know, encourage him to, you know, spend his time and effort on designing this space gun or this sun gun and you can't even get into space and it's 3.5 square miles surely they were you know <clears throat> let's say they could put a man in space you know the first submarine was used in, in uh, the civil war right and the guys I've seen those things They went down, and it was semi-watertight. And I think the crank in a car, right? So on one end, it was attached to the prop. On the other end, it was just attached to the bearings. Well, it ran the length of the sub pretty much. So with like six or seven guys in there, and they each had a handle, like was on where the piston would go on a crank. And they were all set from each other. So am I pulling up? You're pushing down. And there's six or seven of us rotating on this shaft, which is rotating the prop. That's how they powered the submarine. But they could go underwater. You know? So in, in the Civil War, they could go underwater. Yet sunk two or three times. It killed a bunch of them. And it did one one thing, you know, it, maybe two. But they the Germans couldn't even go into space. You know, they had an awesome rocket. Maybe they were thinking, man, we're just, you know, take the explosive out and put a dude in there and we'll shoot him straight up into space. And what's he going to live in once he gets up there? How's he going to get back? So anyway. But it is possible, I assume, that if you were to take mirrors, reflectors, into space and, you know, put them together on a panel, it only makes sense if it was big enough, you know, that you could, you know, reflect the sunlight down to Earth. And you know it would do what it says it's going to do. Because if you've ever had the unfortunate experience of having the sun reflect even off of a car windshield uh, at just the right angle, you know, and it's not even a mirror, it's blinding. You know, it, it's just in, intense. So you got a mirror up in space where there's no atmosphere to get in the way, and it's just getting, you know, <clears throat> pure sunlight. And then it reflects it, catches it, reflects it down to a point. So, a group of German scientists at the German Army Artillery Proving Grounds began to expand on Oberth's idea of creating a superweapon that could utilize the sun's energy, so-called sun gun, would be part of a space station. 5,100 MI, it says miles to me, but do you think they were planning on putting it 5,000 miles above the Earth? 5,000 miles above the Earth? How, how high is that? All right. Whoa, okay. This diagram shows the relative distance from Earth of three satellite orbits. With low Earth orbit closest to the Earth is 99 to 1200 miles. 
and geostationary orbit is the furthest away at 22,236 miles. Huh. That's crazy. I don't know what I was thinking. I had no idea. I don't know if I've still got that one from prescription. Uh, Clell says he used a Fresnel lens from an old big screen TV to boil water once. I've got one that was on the back of a, or on the front of, a projection screen TV. Big old jobber. I don't know if I still got that or not. I kept it around forever. Every once in a while I'd get <clears throat> curious about it again and take it out. But it was so ungainly to use. It was just huge. I thought about, this is back when I had a pool, you know, like one of those 15 foot round pools. If you made you a scaffolding, you know, something that you could frame it and hold it, and you put a target in the pool, not the bottom of the pool, but something that would float on the water maybe, maybe in the water, that was huge, bigger. I always wondered if you could focus that thing on the target and get it to heat the water by heating that, let's just say it was a big uh, cast iron skillet or something, you know what I mean, that you put in the pool and you focus the light into it, do you think you could heat that and then that would heat the water? Or maybe you could just not focus it on the bottom of the pool, but just focus it enough inside the pool to make it heat the water in the pool. I always thought about that, but... Mad scientists got to have a lot of free time. I mean, unless you're developing these weapons for, you know, taking over the world or, you know, stealing the moon or something like that, there's no money in it usually. So you're wasting all your free time on just to see if you can heat the pool when you can go out and you could buy, you know, something new worked, you know, 100 feet of black coiled water pipe and you you know pumped water through it and let the sun heat it that way you know but i always wondered if you could do that focus it and then you know once you got it and proved that it would work <clears throat> then what you could do is set it up like one of those telescopes that follows the moon you know it, it, it pans and tilts at the same speed and keeps the moon in focus all through its travel or Mars or whatever you tend to look at. So you could get one of those so that it would track the sun across the sky and always keep it, you know, trained on the pool. You get your pool water up to like really, really hot. That'd be cool. But anyway, apparently 5,000 miles above the earth is nothing. I don't know what I was thinking. I mean, I'm thinking, I mean, you know, Atmosphere is not that. How deep is the atmosphere? I mean, it, isn't it this is like five or six miles? God, what? Look. Up, way up, the clouds you see in the sky, the wind that is moving the trees, or the flags in your schoolyard, even the sunshine you feel on your face. These are all results of Earth's atmosphere. <clears throat> Earth's atmosphere stretches from the surface of the planet up to as far as 6,214 miles. That's, I don't know, really? See, this is what I'm thinking, 62 miles. While there's really no clear boundary between where Earth's atmosphere ends and outer space begins, most scientists use a delineation known as the Kármán line located 62 miles above Earth's surface to denote the transition point. Since 99.99997% of Earth's atmosphere lies beneath this point. Well, that makes more sense. So who in the devil says it's 6,000 miles up there? 
this is why I can't understand why they think that, you know, carbon's making the earth harder. They can't even come up with an idea how, how high the atmosphere is and somebody agree on it. Ain't no dang wonder. They can't predict the weather for tomorrow. Much less, you know, 100 years from now or 10 years from now or whatever. So, based on 62 miles, 5,000 miles is huge. But, if you're looking at satellites, 5,000 miles is nothing. But here again, I come back to my original point. <clears throat> the dudes couldn't get out of the atmosphere anyway, right? How are they, why were they planning on this sun gun? I don't know. <clears throat> Maybe Hitler was being optimistic and said, man, this thing's going so well, you know, we'll all be here in a hundred years and we'll see it, you know, we'll see it come to fruition. Not, but they had had pretty crazy ideas. Pretty crazy ideas. So that's one of their big guns. So they used, they were working on a sonic cannon using methane combustion chamber to create a 44 hertz sound wave of high intensity, further amplified by parabolic reflectors. The weapon was somehow somewhat effective, but very vulnerable to damage. Later in the war, there were experiments in shooting planes with x-rays and accelerated particles. There were also rumors of flying saucers, foo fighters, mysterious machines with radioactive and other exotic aircraft and super weapons that bordered on science fiction. So they had a flying wing. That back then I think would have been science fiction. So and they had night vision. And they had huge, huge, huge how how did they build these things? How do they have the money? Look at these dudes with these leather coats, too. They provided these guys with leather coats, man. Good stuff. Good stuff. Gone. And Ollie's good stuff. Cheap. All right. My throat hurt. Hmm. Imagine that. I should have, should have got some more water, man. Should have got some more water. I drank all I had. And that's all it was. Alright. Appreciate you guys coming. If you were at the first. Uh, I don't know how that's going to play out. But anyway. There was two programs. One was working. One wasn't. I had to delete one. So. That should be taken care of now. I hope. <clears throat> anyway, I hope coming up Monday's gonna be better. It's been a rough week. Rough week. All right, yep, Clay, I appreciate it. Robert, I hope you aren't too full and busting over like a tick from today's festivities. Hope you want something cool. Do you want anything cool, Robert? I bet he's already logged off. And Gone to the Bud refrigerator and get him another coldie. All right. Well, this here ends. Oh, you did get something? Or you already, what'd you get? Can you say on the internet waves what you got? Ooh. Are you keeping me in suspense, Robert? You got some hand soap. Robert got some hand soap. Well, I hope it's nice and smelly hand soap. It makes your hands all soft and supple. Not all rough and coarse.
and some Asian soup bowls. Hey, I got one of those Asian soup bowls with the chopsticks built in. Yeah, there you go. I gave those to my daughters for Christmas. <laughs> they like them. Yeah, they like that stuff. So, re-gifting. That's the way to go. Free gifts are the best gifts. All right. I'll hopefully see you guys Monday. Same bat time. Same bat channel. See y'all.